Hey guys, hope you're doing well with all the corona craziness and quarantine life. So really quick, I wanted to talk about the process I went through of getting my FAA Part 107 license to fly a drone commercially. But before we get into that, I just kind of want to talk a little bit about my story with drone footage. Um, I just remember like first seeing it on YouTube, guys like Casey Neistat, um, Maddie Hapoya, um, and I always thought it was really, really cool. And essentially, I just wanted to be able to produce drone shots as well. Like, I think as a filmmaker, as somebody that provides video production for people, I think it's an essential thing to have in your belt. So I ended up buying a drone like a year ago. I used it exclusively as a recreational thing. Like, my family and I went to Kauai and I took it there and just got some shots with it there. And so I bought the Mavic Air. And I just really spent that first year kind of getting to know it, learning how the controls worked, seeing if it was something I was good at and therefore wanted to make money with before I decided to get my license. I think it's really important to have integrity with your business. And so therefore, if you have a drone, like make sure you're licensed before you get paid work. Um, otherwise, just keep it fun, keep it recreational. Man, it is so bright out here right now. My eyes are probably squinting so bad. I'm not totally sure why I came to the rooftop. I thought it would be a good idea, but probably at midday, it's a little too harsh. Next time I'll know. So that being said, I just know it's a huge part of being a filmmaker, which is why I decided to do it. So anyways, how I... How I decided to pursue getting a drone license was, you know, obviously the first thing is go on YouTube, right? Um, so I went on YouTube, went on Google, and I just, the first thing I did was I searched FAA drone license. So the first thing that popped up in YouTube was actually Tony Northrup's guide, and I highly recommend it. I probably watched a grand total of about three times before I took the test, and you can check out the link below if you're interested in seeing that as well. I highly recommend it. I also checked out Tony's study guide as well. He has like a list of all these different facts, like all the random numbers and variables you have to remember. It's a really good idea to take it and study right before your actual exam. Just like look over all the numbers and notes just to see like what are all the things you have to remember because there's a bunch of little numbers you have to have memorized. There's also some practice tests that Tony had linked in his study guide as well. If you just watch his study guide, you'll have all the links right there to be well prepared, but I'll go ahead and link those as well below. I also looked briefly at the FAA's website. It can be a little tricky to navigate because just like any other government website, it's, it can feel a little overly complicated, but it was helpful in some ways. And I'll also have that linked below as well. So those three things were the main things that helped me to pass that test. So a couple things to note, the actual process of setting up your exam time and all the details involved with that is actually kind of in depth and a little more complicated than I thought it would be. So feel free to reach out to me, message me, uh, find me on Instagram and message me through there. I would love to help you through that process. Also, maybe if this video hits 25 likes, um, I will create a video outlining all those steps and making it simple. 25 likes may not sound like a lot, but being a brand new YouTuber, um, that would be a ton for me. So yeah, if this video gets 25 likes, I'll create that video. Just 25, you say? Yes, because I'm a brand new YouTuber. Ah, my hair's getting all messed up. By the way, I haven't gotten a haircut in like a month and a half, maybe even more. This quarantine is not helping my hairstyle. Another thing to note is that I definitely encountered some questions that I was totally unprepared for. They came totally out of left field. Tony didn't talk about them. Hold for the helicopter. There are so many military helicopters here in San Diego. It makes it really hard to shoot videos outside. Lots of jets too. They'll just like shoot over and just So yeah, I definitely encountered some questions that were out of left field. Tony's video didn't cover them. Other people's videos and study guys didn't cover them. It was almost like the FAA had just introduced some new questions and that led to some of why I felt some fear before taking the test. But I was kind of afraid that like all the practice tests I was doing and all the numbers I was studying would all be changed or different. And while that was true for a couple questions, it was really only for maybe five or six questions tops. For the most part, all the other questions were basically what I'd already learned through those study guides. And ultimately just doing Tony's study guide and just doing those some of those practice tests and studying some of those numbers and looking at the FAA website briefly led me to getting an 88 out of 100, which is way more than enough to pass. Uh, I think you only need 70 to pass. So all that being said, yes, in March 2020, you can still use these study guides to enable you to pass the FAA Part 107 test. And they'll help you become a safe drone pilot too, so there's really nothing for you to lose. So one last piece of advice I'll share is just, even after passing the test, I realized that I still had to be so careful every time I flew. 
Like just because I passed the test doesn't mean that all of a sudden all this knowledge is just up there and it stays there and I don't have to like think about it before I fly. The reality is, is that it's still just as easy to fly and safe now after passing the test as it was before. And I really, really don't advise flying your drone nonchalantly. Get your Part 107 license, get drone insurance, apply for FAA permission before you fly in an authorization zone. Don't be dumb and break the rules. If anyone pressures you into flying or says, oh, it's not a big deal, just go ahead and fly, that's kind of a yellow flag, maybe a red flag. Seriously, build your business on integrity and not on the path of least resistance. Plus the FAA could maybe find you down the road. Um, I've heard stories of them like looking up past flights. Not totally sure about that, but I think I've read before that, that the FAA can track every single flight you've done. So yeah, just fly as though you're always being watched. And I'd even recommend before you launch, like scout out your area, scan the surroundings, you know, go on Google Earth and make a flight plan first. Not only is it way safer, but it'll also improve your shots so much. There's nothing worse than taking off without a plan and then being like, uh, I, I don't know where to go. Maybe I'll go over here. Oh wait, that's not gonna work. I'll fly back over here. Uh. Whenever you're trying to film and take photos with your drone in a hurry, trust me, it never works out. So yeah, I hope this video is really helpful to you if you're one of the people thinking about getting your Part 107 license. Um, I highly recommend it. There's a lot of actually really cool things you learn throughout the process that I really enjoyed learning. Um, it did take a lot of studying. Um, I did have to cram the night before. I did arrive like half an hour early at the testing site just so I could be able to have time to relax and kind of review some notes before I went in and I highly recommend that. So yeah, feel free to share any other advice if I missed anything and uh, I'll see you guys in the next one.